the U.S. Grant Homestead Association, and my purpose here is to welcome you to Georgetown, Ohio, the boyhood home of Ulysses S. Grant, Lieutenant General of the Army and 18th President of the United States. He lived here 16 years, longer than he lived anywhere else. Now, a few, a few uh, technical announcements and maybe a little sales pitch. The exits for today are in the back, uh, down the stairway, in this doorway over here to the side. And uh, I can assure you there is a stairway on the other side of that door that reaches down to the ground uh, level. Uh, restrooms are on the first floor through the glass doors. As you came in, you probably saw them. Uh, please uh, turn off your cell phones if you haven't already. Uh, we did a little th something different this year. We ran a paid advertisement in the Inquirer, and I'm curious just to see how effective it was. How many of you saw it? Great. How many are here because you saw it? That's great. Uh, how many of you saw the ad and didn't come? <laughs> okay, some of the other things we're doing here uh, in Georgetown this spring. Our general annual grant celebration is April 26th through the 29th. On the 26th of April, the Historical Society, Brown County Historical Society, will have a program at the church across the street. And uh, what it will be is a recitation or performance by two individuals reading letters uh, that were actually written between Nettie Taylor and Tom Taylor. Uh, Nettie was a resident here in Georgetown. Tom was married. He was prosecutor of uh, Brown County and went off to the war. And the exchange of letters is very revealing of what life was in the small rural towns during the Civil War and life in particular in Georgetown, which was probably not much different than a lot of other towns around Ohio. But uh, we feel really excited about the quality of this program. Uh, we'll also have, on the Friday night, uh, Fritz Klein will be here as uh, Abraham Lincoln. He will do a presentation at the Floral Hall down on the fairgrounds. Uh, Saturday program will feature several uh, short programs about various parts of the Civil War. Uh, we'll do a reenactment of a discussion between Lincoln, Grant, and Sherman regarding the outcome of the uh, Battle of Shiloh. Uh, we have a couple of new programs, uh, Ernie Parnell and I, those of you who have been to that know about Ernie Parnell, he and I will debate uh, the cause of the Civil War, and it will be moderated by uh, uh, Pat Marchmark. Now, uh, these things don't uh, materialize without money, so we try to have some fundraising efforts. Uh, this year is no... Uh, Exception. We have a quilt out there that's called the Underground Quilt, and we're selling chances uh, five, one for a dollar, five for six for five dollars. We are also taking uh, selling chances on a 19, 1858 Remington Army Colt uh, pistol, not Army Colt, Army pistol. Uh, and you can; those are also a dollar piece or six for five dollars. I apologize that the homestead and the school were not open today. Uh, the Historical Society, Ohio Historical Society, chose uh, the last couple of months to start some improvements. So the furniture was all taken out of the homestead and moved down to the schoolhouse. But it'll be open, we hope, it'll be open uh, for the celebration. Now another project we have that maybe some of you have noticed or read about is the statue that uh, we are having uh, created for this little park up on the square in front of the courthouse. We're selling bricks at $35 each that you can have a family name, your name, your business, uh, carved on that brick, and it'll be part of the plaza at the base of the statue. Uh, those applications are available. Uh, you can take one of those applications 
with you home and go about it out. Uh, the celebration program, if you want more details, we have that. Uh, and uh, you can also buy a bench. We have one bench left for the little park area. It is $1,500. So if you're a business or as an individual, you want to buy a bench for the little park area around the statue, there is one still available. Uh, Mr. Um, Barr's materials and books will be available out front. Uh, we have receiving tide, which is this presentation today is based upon, and we have a couple of other books that he's written out there. Uh, Ed will be available down here in front to uh, autograph your, your book if you buy something. Uh, the library at the Mary B. Shelton branch of the Brown County Library here in town has a large collection of Civil War volumes, and particularly on Grant, and those are available to be checked out. Uh, of course, they'd like for you to be sure to bring them back. <laughs> but uh, those are available. Uh, we have DVDs. We'll have DVDs of this production and also the past four that we sponsored Mr. Uh, Mars for his presentation. So uh, these are $15 a piece. Now, uh, I'd like to introduce a member of our community for a special presentation. He is a member of the Georgetown Village Council and is the president of the council, Chris Renshaw. Chris is a local surveyor. For Chris.
were somewhere around 400 men. On the last day of June, 1863, uh, the roll call for the 61st Ohio was 418 men. They fought the first day out on the fields north of Gettysburg with the 11th Corps. Uh, they were the batter, they were the, the infantry support for Dilger's battery, battery I of the 1st Ohio Infantry or Artillery. They and Dilger performed a fighting retreat through the streets of Gettysburg down the Carlisle Road and then out the Baltimore Pike and were stationed at the very left of the arch at the Evergreen Cemetery. For those of you who've been to Gettysburg know exactly where they are. So that's where they were stationed for the next two days. They were part of the unit that repelled the Louisiana Tigers assault on Cemetery Hill. On the second evening, they were called to go over to the to Culp's Hill and reinforce the 12th Corps. And after the Confederates were finally pushed back down off of Culp's Hill, one of the men from the 12th Corps looked over at one of the six men from the 61st Ohio and said, I don't know who you guys are, but if, you, if the damn 11th Corps could fight like you, we wouldn't be in this fix. And the man from the 61st replied, we are the damn 11th Corps. <laughs> and we did fight like this. <laughs> On July 4th, 1863, the 61st Ohio had 198 men make roll call. At, Getty, at Vicksburg, there were several units with Ulysses S. Graham. The 70th Ohio, the 48th Ohio, 47th Ohio, and the 4th Independent Ohio Volunteer Cavalry. The 70th was part of a 70,000 man, or 7,000 man force placed between Vicksburg and Jackson, Mississippi as Grant's rear guard. Their only job was to keep the 20 to 30,000 odd Confederates in that direction away from Grant's rear. The 47th Ohio won 16 medals of honor in 14 days at Vicksburg. Tom Taylor, who Stan Purdy mentioned before, was their colonel. They won the first group of medal of honors by simply riding along on a boat. They rode down on the barges when the Navy passed the batteries of Vicksburg and floated through the fire. And their job was to repel orders. So they won a lot, several medals there. And then about 10 days later, they had the privilege of uh, attacking the cemetery fort at Vicksburg in what was called the Forlorn Charge. 48th Ohio was involved in the charge on the Louisiana Redan. They carried the ramparts and secured part of the fort, but were pushed out after no support from other troops. They had made it back to their lines when they realized that they no longer had their regimental flag. So they charged again and cap recaptured their regimental flag and brought it back to, the, uh, to their lines. The 4th Independent Ohio Cavalry Company is kind of fond to me. They were about 100 men from Brown County. Their captain was uh, John S. Foster. He was the sheriff of Brown County, and he that they were never incorporated into a regiment. They were a well-armed unit, well-trained, uh, 
and they spent the entire war as headquarter guards for various generals. And you'll recognize a few of the names that they took care of. Halleck, McPherson, Osterhaus, uh, Blackjack Logan. So they were pretty popular guys. Um, at Gettys or at Vicksburg, they were chosen by General Grant to be his guard as they rode in on the day of surrender. Most of the men there were either friends of Grant from Georgetown and Brown County or sons of friends. It's also important to me because the first time I ever met Ed was at Gettysburg and he talked about Vicksburg there and I walked up to ask a question about the 4th Independent Ohio and that's how I got to meet Ed was walking up front to ask that question thus allowing us to be able to eventually bring him here. Um, for those of you who have been here a few times, I uh, have each year Googled Ed to see if there was any new information, at the same time Googled my own name. And last year I found that when I Googled my name, I had 90 hits on the internet, things I had done. And this year I find I have a very busy, very busy year. I now have 180 things on the internet with my name involved. Last year, Ed was a little ahead. He had 43,000 hits. <laughs> but this year, he's slowing, my, my numbers doubled, okay? He's slowing down. This year, he only has 85,300 hits. So he didn't quite double. So I think I'm catching up. So, for those of you, probably most of you all know this history of Ed, but for those who don't know, I'll quickly talk about Ed a second. He was born in Billings, Montana. Uh, he grew up in Sarpy, Montana, on what was been called a rugged family cattle ranch, the Ebar S. His love of history started very early. His father was a World War I Marine, and he read stories of military campaigns to Ed and his brother. Uh, in, in school, Ed enjoyed history, and I think uh, a book about Jeb Stewart was one of his early favorites. He was known to name a lot of the animals on the ranch after battles, and generals of the Civil War. His favorite milk cow was Antietam. <laughs> the, uh, he graduated from high school in 1941 and hitchhiked that summer around the United States touring Civil War battlefields. I found out at breakfast this morning that uh, he uh, was at home listening to a Bears football game against St. Louis when he heard the news about the Japanese bombing Pearl Harbor. Uh, in April of 1942, he volunteered and joined the Marines and got a little different look at some of the battlefields that we now talk about. Ed was in the Marine Raiders, the 3rd Marine Raiders, and was at Guadalcanal, Russell Islands. He was then in the 7th Regiment of the 1st Marine Division at New Britain. In January 1944, Ed was wounded at Suicide Creek, Cape Gloucester, New Britain, by machine gun fire. He spent 26 months in recovery. Following the war, he was, he used the GI Bill to first get a bachelor's at Georgetown University and then a master's in history in Indiana. For us, a big day, is a, a big year is 1954. It was in 1954, Ed was at Shiloh and met a gentleman named Charles Shield and, or Shed, and decided that 
he would rather interpret battlefields from the battlefield than from a classroom. And thus, we have Ed as a battlefield interpreter in, in the rest of the story as we know it. Ed took a job and worked at Vicksburg where he and a couple other folks found a little gunboat named in Cairo and brought it up. Um, during his time at Vicksburg, he, uh, and in that area, he was involved with finding several lost forks at Grand Gulf, Mississippi. He found, a, he helped him with a variety of new parks, including Pea Ridge, Wilson's Creek. Um, he led efforts at Fort Smith, at Stones River, Fort Donaldson, at the battlefields around Richmond, the Bighorn Cannon, Canyon. He was involved in getting the Eisenhower Farm at Gettysburg into the National Park System, the Gold Miners Route over Chillicook Pass in, the, in uh, Alaska, the President LBJ, LB Johnson Ranch, Fort Moultrie, Fort Point, the William Howard Taft House, Fort Hancock at the Boston Navy Yard, and the Herbert Hoover National Historic Site. In 1966, he was transferred to Washington, D.C. In 1981, was named the Chief Historian for the National Park Service. He held that until 1994. And since then, has been Chief Historian Emeritus. Now, I think when we think about our retirement, maybe it's not exactly what we think of when we think of Ed's retirement, because I know he's still on the road several hundred days a year, still leading tours for the Smithsonian and other groups. And as I think without doubt, the most renowned Civil War historian uh, in the world. We are definitely humbled by the chance to get Ed to come here every year, and I will now give you Ed Bars. Confederates hold an impregnable position there. 
and the Confederates will lose around uh, 4,500 men. You don't win a war, even if you have more men and resources, if you fight many battles in which you lose three times as many men as the enemy. In January, Rosecrans, much like that person with the unpronounceable name that used to be in Little Abner, with a cloud of gloom hanging over his head, with his name spelled in constants, probably Joe Spleek, will run into a worse disaster, the mud march. At the end of the mud march, the Army of the Potomac's morale has reached its lowest point in the war. Burnside's is relieved of command, and to bring in a new player on the field, a man who had lusted to command the army, the ladies would all like him well. He's a bachelor, and finally will succumb to a wealthy maiden, heiress, from Cincinnati in 1865. That is Joseph Hooker. <coughs> the Blue Nose Colonel Henry Adam, uh, Charles Francis Adams, describes Hooker's headquarters as a place no lady would be seen. <laughs> and a gentleman would prefer not to go. So I imagine most of the people, red brother people like I would, would want to serve on Hooker's staff. <laughs> <laughs> Hooker's temper immediately restores the Army's morale. Pay is resumed, furloughs are granted, and by the first, the second week in April, when Lincoln visits the army, he has turned the army of the Potomac around. Lincoln is impressed by all he sees, somewhat worried about some he hears. He hears that Hooker talks more about what he is going to do to General Lee. He will send, when I take the offensive, will run him all the way to the Gulf of Mexico and be waiting for him when he lands in California. Lincoln becomes concerned on only one thing, and he uh, will be worried that maybe Hooker will do like his other generals in the East, will not put all his men into action when he meets Robert E. Lee. In fact, General Hooker is also quoted in front of Lee, and, he, and the press loves General Hooker. You love a person that makes good one-liners. One of his one-liners is, when I meet General Lee, may God have mercy on him, because I certainly will not. This will be the situation on the eve of Chancellorsville, which, of course, will commence in the last days of April and will reach a climax that we'll come back to shortly on the 30th day of April. When it does, even the officers who think that Hooker is a blowhard thinks that he has maneuvered Lee out of his position. When on the evening of the 30th, says that General Lee has but two options. To come out and beat me on a ground of my choosing, or in gloriously free and rest convinced that I will have no mercy on him. But Unfortunately for the North, unfortunately for the Ohio boys in the 11th or that Hooker is going to lose his nerve on the first day of July. Now we'll go out east, out west. Now our friends, do we have any of our friends from Lancaster, Ohio here? Well, they probably are not. 
going to like what I'm going to say next. <laughs> Southwest, General Grant has begun his first advance on Vicksburg, moving southward down the uh, New Orleans, Jackson, and Great Northern Railroad, and by the beginning, into the second week of December, has reached the Tallahassee River and occupied Oxford, Mississippi. Things look good for General Grant. Even better for General Sherman. Because General McLaren has lobbied with the President, <coughs> being knowing him well, and being a popular figure with the war Democrats, he had traveled to Antietam. If you look at pictures of Lincoln's visit at Antietam, which takes place between the second day of October and the fifth day of October, General McLaren is very obvious in the picture. He has accompanied Lincoln out to Antietam and has sold Lincoln as a war Democrat. Many of my constituents are not happy with that preliminary Emancipation Proclamation that you issued on the 22nd day of, of, uh, of September saying that in 100 days, if the Confederate armies are still in the field, all people held and welded in certain designated parts of the South will be sent forward and forever free. This is not welcomed by many war Democrats who are, who are more interested, as McLaren knows, in the Union and control of the Mississippi River. And so far, the Union Navy and the Union Army has not done very well at seizing Vicksburg and Port Hudson, those choke points on the Mississippi. And McClellan makes, goes out, rallies troops, many of these regiments from Ohio in the 100 series will be raised and the call from McLaren that he's going to lead an army down the Mississippi River. And the president has given him that mission. But McLaren makes a bad mistake. General Halleck is a member of that trade union. He may have been a problem to General Grant, but both he and General Grant belong to a trade union. They're graduates of West Point. And General McLaren is a graduate of the political hustlings in Illinois, although born in Kentucky. So Grant may not have been Halleck's favorite fellow, but he's definitely preferable to General McLaren, that politician. And Lincoln is a little troubled Excuse me, Alec is a little troubled that McLaren has been given this plum of leading the expedition down the Mississippi. So troops raised by McLaren are assembling in Memphis, but McLaren is an unhappy bereaved widower and has been smitten by his late wife's sister and is planning to marry her on Christmas Eve take the field and have a honeymoon, her traveling with him, along with Governor Tricky Dick Gates of Illinois, the original Dickie Dick, and Captain Vicksburg. But since the troops are doing nothing in Memphis, going their heels, Sherman will send General, Grant will send General Sherman, who has joined him at Oxford, Mississippi, back to Memphis, and he, if McLaren is not there, 
Sherman will take the men that McLaren has raised, men made available by the president, and lead them on the march down the Mississippi. Sherman has a short deadline. Now you have to be very careful of Sherman's memoirs. Unlike Grant's memoirs, Grant's memoirs, while Grant is not, does not damn himself, he has a good memory and not a selecting memory that General Sherman will do. So Sherman will arrive back at Memphis with a division from Grant's army, picks up two divisions that McLaren had raised, and decides he'd better get started down the river fast. Because if McLaren gets, joins the army, Sherman is second in command of that force to General John Andrew McLaren. But he knows that McLaren is getting married in Jacksonville, Illinois, on the 24th day of December. So Sherman will leave Memphis on the 20th day of December with McLaren's two divisions, his division, and go down to Helena, Arkansas, where he is on the eve, on the morning of the 21st. In his memoirs, you will tell a film. He will say that he doesn't know that Earl Van Dorn on the 20th, that's the, if you were good Southern girls, you like General Van Dorn. Because he's a ladies' man, and like all ladies' men, dies in the hands of a jealous husband. <laughs> he will descend on Holly Springs at daybreak on the 20th, just as Sherman's men are arriving at Helena, Arkansas, captures Grant's immediate supply base, and tortures. At the same time, Bedford Forest is astride the southern, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Mobile and Ohio Railroad destroyed. No through trains will pass southward of Columbus, Kentucky until the eighth day of March. Unfortunately, for Sherman's veracity, you know that Morgan L. Smith reaches Helena on the morning of the 21st and says, no, General Sherman, I think we may be in some trouble <laughs> because Van Dorn is in Holly Springs and Forrest is tearing up the railroad. So Sherman says, off to Vicksburg, leaving behind his pot and train in Memphis, gets to Vicksburg on the 26th, lands at Johnson's Plantation, 12 miles up the mouth of the Yazoo on the 26th and 27th, and attacks the Confederates at Vicksburg at Chickasaw Bluff on the 29th. What is Pepper to do? As soon as Grant falls back from the Tallahatchie, takes the pressure out of Pepper, he rushes men to Vicksburg, and Sherman shows now a strange thing. The, the library records for West Point of borrowing books are extant. And it shows that his collateral reading Grant read romance novels. He did not check out books on Hannibal, Napoleon, or the Great Conqueror. His principal literature. So Sherman shows 
after Chickasaw Bayou, that he's read about Caesar and knows that Caesar, one of his most quoted ones, I crossed the Rubicon, Rubicon. I attacked the enemy and succeeded. So Sherman says he doesn't do well at Chickasaw Bayou, paraphrases Caesar. I landed at the time appointed, assaulted, and failed. <laughs> He's back at Milligan's Bend on the second day of January, when the very irate bridegroom arrived. <laughs> and the new bride, finding out that Sherman has taken his army, used his army, and suffered a repulse. So McLaren takes over the army, Now Sherman, you're now a corps commander under me, commanding the 15th Corps. I'm the army commander, and George Morgan is commanding the 13th Corps. McLaren will then move against uh, Arkansas Post and Catholic. Grant will be unhappy to learn that McLaren has gone on a wild goose chase as he quotes it into the wilds of Arkansas and has forgot about Vicksburg. He checks with Alec and Alec says, if you transfer your line of advance to the Mississippi, you're in command of McLaren. You rank him. So Grant heads down the river from Memphis, establishes his headquarters, at Milliken's Bend and will operate against Vicksburg. <laughs> the president sanctions it, although uh, he probably hopes, uh, he hopes Grant can, and Grant is going to be working under a time bomb because McLaren is not happy at that trade school working against him. So things don't look good in the West. Because Grant is going to operate against Vicksburg and attempt to reach the high ground north and south of Vicksburg. If he can bypass Vicksburg, he can approach it from the east. But the Grant's canal in front of Vicksburg doesn't work. The Yazoo Pass, approaching Vicksburg by way of Yazoo Pass, and the cold water, the Yalabusha and the, and the Yazoo don't work. The attempt to bypass Vicksburg by way of Lake Providence and bayous and rivers draining the Red River fail. And the Seals Bayou, the Navy is lucky to escape without losing their gunboat. So we might say that U.S. Grant has again reached a crisis in his command. Somewhat similar to what occurred after Shiloh, when the press is announcing Grant is a drunk, and has been surprised, and how it reorganizes the army and makes Grant second in command. And he takes over the army group. And Grant finds himself temporarily, as he had after Donaldson, reduced to no command, or worse, second in the command of Halleck, where he's in essence counting paper clips <laughs> for old Grant. And uh, so he's again, the prophets of doom are beginning, and McLaren storing it up. Give me the army. Give me the army, and I will capture Vicksburg. So Grant is on a uh, uh, is a, a, on a time. Uh, the fuse is burning and burning close. So Grant has to come up with a new plan. Well, Sherman and McPherson say his two favorite men, members of that trade union, more effective than the teachers' union. West Point graduates. Well, tell Grant, time's run out for us. Let's all go back 
to Memphis and start over again, just like we were trying to do in December. Grant says, I better not do that, because if I go to Memphis, I've taken a step back 200 miles. And what happens if Forrest Van Dorn can't be a problem anymore? Because the Dulles does, does, does husband has killed him. Supposing the Confederate cavalry gives me the same trouble they did in December. He says, I'm going to take my army and I'm going to march it down the west side of the Mississippi River through the floodplains of the alluvial Mississippi River and cross the Mississippi River somewhere south of New Carthage and reach the high ground. Sherman and McPherson will tell him, don't do it, General. You're doing what the enemy would maneuver for a month to get you in a position like that. Now, the only one that thinks it's a good idea is General McLaren. So that means that General McLaren gets to lead the march south. And the Confederates don't realize what Grant is doing. So between, so by the 16th day of, the, of April, McLaren's Corps is now south of, of New Carthage. McPherson is still up at Lake Providence. Sherman is still at Young's Point. Now comes a crucial time. Now, Rose makes sure that Julia's around as much as you can. Think of a married couple. Think of a couple outside of the wife wanting power. Think of a very devoted couple, arguably the most devoted couple that's ever in the White House. General, the Grants are. So Julia and the four children are visiting the army. Julia and the children and the other officers' wives know that Porter is going to take his gunboats, mentioned slightly, associated with the 47th Ohio, and uh, run them past the Vicksburg batteries. And they do it successfully. The gunboats, along with three transports. On the 22nd, six nights later, is when the 47th Ohio goes down on barges with five more, six more transports. Five more transports. So Grant now has his troops south of the city. He has a way of getting him across the river, and he's ready to cross the stream. So things are improving. He has done, and again, Grant on the 28th will say goodbye to Julia. You take the three younger children, two boys and a daughter, go back to St. Louis, go back to St. Louis County, stay with your father-in-law and leave me here, and I'll keep Fred with me. Now Fred is 12, going on 13. So he gets Colonel Badeau and say you can be the glorified babysitter for Fred. <laughs> now one of the best books you read on the Vicksburg campaign is Fred's reminiscence of when he was 12 years old and goes on one of Grant's great campaigns. So the Grant's men have now got the transportation south of the river. They have the uh, troops south of the river, and McPherson gets orders to move southward and support McLaren when he crosses the river. Meanwhile, we've now moved to the end of April. And on the 30th day of April, the same day that General Hooker has reached the Chancellorsville intersection, it is going and going on what he's going to do to Lee the next day. And even General Meade and General Slocum, who detest the very ground that General Hooker that walks on, thinks that old Joe has carried it out. 
On the first, so on that thirtieth, the Union gunboats, having failed to silence the Confederate gunboats, the batteries at Grand Gulf run the Grand Gulf gauntlet, and on the thirtieth. McClellan's men cross the mighty Mississippi River at Bruinsburg, being followed that night by McPherson's division. Now, the first is a good day for U.S. Grant. May it the first day of May. The first day of May is not a good day for General Hooker. Not quite as bad as the third day of May is going to be. Because on the first day of May, Grant's men make it, instead of halting, like Hooker does at Chancellorsville, Grant pushes McLaren inland on the night of the 30th day of April. And on the first day of April, instead of losing his nerve, General Grant defeats the Confederates at the Battle of Mark Gibson. McLaren, McPherson will join McLaren late in the day, and 24,000 Yankees, because of Grant's daring and, uh, and use of uh, command and control, beat 8,000 Confederates. That's how you're a good general. <laughs> And in the next, between the first day of, of uh, May and the evening of the 18th day of May, Grant will beat the Confederates five times. He'll march his men better than 200 miles and uh, will do something he could not have done. The first thing is, when he win, wins the Battle of Port Gibson, has his army on the high ground, and gets to Port Gibson, his orders are, take one of your corps, either McLaren's or McPherson's, and go down and join General Banks and capture Port Gibson. Grant is no dummy. He knows that Banks ranks him. So he also knows that you don't have cell phones. <laughs> if you had a cell phone Grant's campaign, which I'd like to say makes Jackson's Valley campaign, uh, the next 17 days of Grant will make Valley, Jackson's Valley campaign all my good Confederates here, like Paul Weber, will be soon throwing a rock committee at me, <laughs> like something quoting Vince Lombardi out of the Little Sisters from the Poor. <laughs> <laughs> but the only way Washington can say no, Grant says that they knew I was here, they knew I was on high ground, they would approve me for getting what they're telling me. Take one core and go to Port Hudson. So he dutifully sends a message by courier to Washington telling him he's not going to do what they're going to do. <laughs> probably, probably Bush number one and Schwarzburg Danger wishes they'd done it is during Desert Storm, when they have the Iraqis long before Bush II, where they want them, where they have her short, and he calls them back. Too bad, cell phone. Too bad, fighting communication. Because Grant is not going to find out. The War Department says, don't do it. Do what we told you originally. But at that time he receives it, he has just won the Battle of Port of Big Black. It's the evening of the 17th. McLaren's men have broken the Union Bridge at the Big Black, 
and if in between won the Battle of Raymond on the 12th, won the Battle of Jackson on the 14th, won the Battle of Champion Hill on the 16th, and they got the Confederates in a very, very bad way. And Grant, this is memoirs, tells you they just out of McClellan's men have broken the Confederate defense line at the big plot. A man arrives with a message from Washington telling, don't do what you did. <laughs> Checked. 
with losses of about 900 men and Confederates about 100. So Grant pulls back. Now, one of the heroes of the, now the, the only thing I'm really going to focus on is the forlorn hope. Now, on the night, on the 20th, 20th, Grant decides it's going to be an all out attack on Vicksburg. On the, and it's going to be on the 21st. We're not going to dig around. We're going to bring up all the artillery we have. We're going to attack with all divisions on the field. Sherman, two of Sherman's three divisions, all of the uh, McPherson's divisions, all of Carmen's. We're going to hammer the enemy from 6 o'clock in the morning to 10 o'clock. And we're then going to look at our watches, and we're going to, the artillery is going to cease firing at 10 a.m. And then each of the corps are going to attack. Now Sherman comes up with his attack. It's going to be delivered what they call Cemetery Hill, but actually the park is called Stockade Redan. He's going to mass 10,000 men for a breast on the graveyard road. Now he wants to lead the charge because there's a ditch in front of the rebel works. And the men that are going to be in that forlorn hope are going to be 150 volunteers, 50 from each of the three brigades in Frank Blair's division. Now, uh, so uh, that means that uh, each brigade is going to have to divvy up 50 men. So the brigade, uh, 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 the, uh, the brigade commanded by Giles Smith has the 47th Ohio. So they're going to have 17 men volunteer. Now they'll give the brigade flag will be carried by Private Trotter. The man who will lead the charge will be Captain Gault, G-A-U-L-T. And they'll charge down that road. But they find out the artillery bombardment wasn't very good. And when this when the forlorn hope debouches through a narrow cut in the road, a hundred yards from the stockade dam, they find those rebels are pretty fighting mad in there. They open fire. Cogden, Galt, and a number of men get in the ditch. Now the next regiment that comes is going to be the 30th Ohio. Some of them get into the ditch. Thank God you don't have any people from this proud Brown County in the 37th Ohio. They're from up around Toledo. And when they hit that narrow cut in the road, seeing the dead and wounded, they don't go any farther. So Sherman's attack is over on the morning of the 20th of, of the 20th of the uh, 22nd day of uh, uh, May. The first one's attack is stopped easily. McClernand's men gets men into the second, uh, into the uh, fort, into the uh, railroad redoubt, including men of the uh, of 48th Ohio. Not, they do not get part possession of two works like McClernand message will say to Grant. The attacks will be renewed in the afternoon and it's not a good day for the Army uh, for Grant's army. 39, 3,199 men killed, wounded, or missing. So Grant decides to lay siege to Vicksburg. And the siege to Vicksburg will continue. 
Now, uh, at the bottom of Raymond, you're all proud to know the Union advance of Raymond is led by Captain Foster, the sheriff of Brown County. That's Foster's company. And not only Foster's hanging around with Clarence's headquarters, I mean, excuse me, but Ferson's headquarters on the 17th day of, of uh, June. So the siege is underway. That's when the 70th Ohio finally gets down here. So they have to stay on the exterior line. Uh, looking for Joe Johnson, who Grant thinks might be coming, but if you know Joe Johnson, you know he ain't going to be coming, but Grant doesn't have that luxury. And uh, by the 17th, time runs out for General McLaren. Uh, McLaren makes a bad strategic error. He issues a congressional order to the men of the uh, 13th Corps, saying, or how good they did in casting slings and arrows at McPherson and Sherman. That's that McPherson and Sherman who waste no time in calling it to General Grant's attention. And uh, Grant decides that he'll relieve McLaren. The siege will continue and of course by the third day, uh, by the second day of July, Gettysburg, Vicksburg is getting in very bad shape. The Confederates may have 30,000 men there, but they only have 18,000 men fit for duty. Now, of course, on the second day of July is the Confederates' last chance to win at Gettysburg. The Confederates have begun their advance northward to Gettysburg on the on the 10th day of June. They crossed the uh, Potomac River, the first troops, infantry crossing, crossing on the 22nd. On the 26th day of June, Lee will resume the advance. His men having reached Chambersburg, sending General Ewell on to occupy Harrisburg, York, and Carlisle. Meanwhile, time has run out for General Hooker on the 27th. The relieving will command, and on the night, morning of the night of the 27th and 28th, General Meade is named to command the Army of the Potomac. So on the first day of July, the day that the Confederate trial is, Johnson is finally beginning to move, maybe, toward relieving Vicksburg, Henry calls a meeting of his senior officers. His four division commanders, and they meet. Pemberton wants to continue to defend. To hold out a while longer, but the division commanders will vote, we try to get terms. Pemberton says, I know my people. Pemberton was born in Philadelphia of Quaker parents. He, when he went to West Point at Taurus, he turned his back on the Quaker church. When he, when he married a lady from Norfolk, Virginia, she wearing the trousers in his family, he turns his back on the North and casts his lot in the South. So he says, I know my people. And I believe to get a surrender on the 4th, knowing their vanity, I believe they'll give us good terms. So it's agreed that they will have a meeting. Now, representing the Confederates will be General Bowen, accompanied by Lieutenant by Lieutenant Colonel Montgomery. Strange to say, they ride through the Confederate arc lines at 3.30 in the afternoon Greenwich time. At 3.30 in the afternoon on July 3rd, Pickett's men have had it. And the charge was crested and they're falling back. 
Pemberton and Grant, Grant accompanied by Ford, Logan, and the first. Sherman with the 70th Ohio is overwatching the big block in case Johnston comes. So under a shade of an oak, stunning oak tree, Grant, of course, knows quite a thing about the Bible. He'll describe that stunted oak tree will produce more cords of wood than the true cross. So they will introduce them. General Bowen, who knew Grant from Grant's bad years in St. Louis, will introduce Pepperton and Grant. Now, as they meet, Pepperton finds he was disillusioned on what the Union might be willing to give or extort from them to get a surrender on the 3rd of July, on the 4th day of July. And it leads to hot work. They don't reminisce much over the Mexican War like Lee and Grant will at the McLean House before Lee finally says, let's get down to why I came here. <laughs> and they will end in rather hot words. Remember in saying, before I surrender unconditionally, you'll bury many more of your men. Remember when he finds out Grant is back to his hard line that had made him famous and incidentally also sentenced him to death. Because when he becomes famous over unconditional surrender of Grant, some newsmen had read that he liked cigars. Grant didn't smoke cigars up to that time. So these newsmen have included that Grant will get large numbers of boxes of cigars after Donaldson. In fact, at the, on the sixth day of, of uh, May, at the Battle of the Wilderness, which is not one of Grant's best days, Horace Porter will claim that Grant went through 26 cigars in one day. And of course, when Grant leaves this world, when he dies, a very part, a very painful uh, cancer of the throat. So they could have really sentenced him to death. If I, I'm surprised Anna smoking people don't use that. So it's agreed as McPherson and Logan and Ord chat with uh, Bowen. They agree. Let's let things cool. Let's, they suggest to Grant, return to your headquarters and think it over. Now, Julia has joined Grant. Now, why is Julia there so much? <coughs> Grant has a low tolerance <coughs> for alcohol. And evil, he run, he, they have to keep him away from evil companions. The best way for 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 uh, for his chief of staff to do it, Rollins, is to get Julia and the children. So Julia and the younger children have joined Fred and Grant. Think of a commander of a major army living in a tent, and his wife living in a tent. That wouldn't happen today, I can promise you. <laughs> Grant, the uh, uh, commander of the army, no way would the commander of an army live in that small two-room cottage that Grant and Julia and two other four children live at City Point. They would sure kick Rufus Ingalls out of the mansion and take it over the mansion, but things were different. So Grant goes back, thinks it over, and he remembers, he's reminded by Rollins and others, those 13,000 Confederates we captured at Donaldson turned into a can of worms. How do you handle 13,000 prisoners? 
They know this is going to be around 30,000 prisoners. So Grant decides, well, I'm going to be benevolent. So he agrees, and the agreement is that Pemberton will surrender Vicksburg, surrender his army, and, uh, and the soldiers will sign paroles not to fight again the duly exchange. Their equipment will be surrendered, their arms, accoutrements. They forgot to deal with the problem of slaves. Because according to the Emancipation Proclamation, those slaves that are body servants to the Confederates, and those working for the Confederate commissary should be free. If they don't spell that out, that's going to be a big problem, a minor problem. The Confederates have broken the Union code, so in Grant's informing Porter that he's going to be lenient, the Confederates will really call a meeting. What are we going to do? So the vote is 17 to surrender under Grant's generous terms to two again. So they exchange the orders, the, the messages, and the Confederates at 10 p.m. march out on the 4th, 10 a.m. I should have said, from the works, back to arms and open and spreader and march in, and the Union in two columns march in. Marching into Vicksburg via the Jackson Road will be where Grant, Rollins, and the staff go in led by the 45th Illinois, going in on the uh, Baldwin Ferry Road. Um, of course, it's men go in for, uh, one of McPherson's, one of uh, San, San, uh, one of McPherson's divisions uh, will go in first along that road. They'll march in, go to the landing, and Grant will send the official dispatch of the fall of Vicksburg. Again, it gets faster service. It goes by steamboat to Cairo, Illinois. There's no telegraph short of Cairo, Illinois. And Grant will send a message. Now, it will not reach the president till the evening of the seventh day of July. This is very important. Because on the fourth, on the seventh day in the morning, General Meade will issue general orders to the Army of the Potomac, congratulating him on winning the Battle of Gettysburg. He then calls on his men for further exertions to drive the invader from our soil. That word, invader from our soil, triggers Lincoln's anger. Lincoln, as he had at the time of Antietam, is convinced in his mind that Robert E. Lee's army, while it escaped at Antietam, should not escape from Gettysburg. And as, as Lincoln's secretary says, he says, my God, my God, what does that man mean? It is all our soil. He sounds just like George <coughs> B. McClellan. To add this insult to injury, when Lee escapes across the river, the chances of General Meade ever being General in Chief of the Army has now become slim and none. The old cliche is, slim has left town long ago. <laughs> so the road for General Grant will lead from Vicksburg to Missionary Ridge. From Missionary Ridge, it leads to the enactment of a law that expired back in 817. 97. In 1797, 
with war with France threatening, George Washington having retired to Mount Vernon, Congress passes a law establishing the rank of Lieutenant General, General in Chief. So, Elihu Washburn grants patron. All generals have to have a patron in the White House or in Congress. Washburn is the uh, chairman of the House Military Affairs Committee, and he had saved Grant from Halleck after Donaldson. And he will introduce the law, which the president has asked him to do, recreating the right of lieutenant general, which had expired with the death of George Washington in 1799. And you will sign into law on the 29th day of February, 1864. It is known that Grant was commander of the military division of the Mississippi, one that he had assumed back in mid-October 1863, uh, that he's called to Washington. Again, to show you the difference in our times today, and in, in my mind, much better than the imperial presidencies we have today. U.S. Grant arrives in advance of his staff in Washington on the 8th day of March. <clears throat> Having come from his command at headquarters at in Nashville, Sherman is uh, taking command. He walks up to the desk clerk. The clerk is not expecting him until late in the day. And he will sign his name, very simple, U.S. Grant and Son. Fred is now 13. That's like he had to keep saying. 12 going on 13. Well, the Grant Society probably will tell me what day it is Fred's birthday. So they sign in. They have to, they have to give them in the same suite, in the words, that Lincoln gets when he arrives in Washington on the 23rd day of February. There's inaugurations. They have to take a New York industrialist out of, uh, out of suites six, uh, five, uh, six and seven, and Grant moves in. Grant is to go to the White House to be introduced to the, the rich, powerful, and the socially, the socially elite. How does he go from the winner to the White House? And I could promise you a guy of less right than he would ride in the limousine. It ain't very far. Grant walks it. And he rides with a little dirt on his shoes, knocks at the door. He's expected. The butler opens the door, and, he's, and he comes in, and five foot eight, a little over five foot eight, no one knows exactly. Now Grant walks in. Now, one of our two tallest presidents, we have two presidents, six foot four. Unfortunately, they didn't know we had another president, six foot four, so you can't say who's the tallest, LBJ or uh, Abraham Lincoln. I'm sure in the spirit world where it is now, LBJ is certainly probably a quarter inch taller than this. <laughs>
Lincoln had said, let them up easy. But Grant had actually gone much further than Lincoln had authorized. And because when the Confederates signed their paroles, they're allowed to return to their home. And as long as they obey the stipulations of the paroles and the law of the land, the government will not proceed against them. So in a way, Lee can take a big, deep breath. He now knows at least that General Grant will be on his side if any people want to bring him to trial for actions he's taken on resigning his commission and leading an army that kills more Union soldiers than any other army does. So I think uh, uh, you get another day of greatness in uh, uh, U.S. Grant, and uh, what we, so you can see why preceding time, the title of that book, because from then on, the Confederates are doomed to lose the war unless the voters, when they go to the polls on the fourth, on the first Tuesday after the first Monday in December and in, in November, Decide they want George to be the powerful president. McClellan is devastating. His defeat is much worse among the soldiers. It is the, the majority of the, of the male voters, the election among male voters is very close to power. But uh, McClellan is destroyed by the vote of the soldiers. They're the ones that are voting. We've got to. They're voting for the continuation of the war. The continuation of the war uh, means they're betting their lives on it. So thank you for your attention. If anyone has any questions, I'll try to answer them. If not, I, and then I, afterwards I will autograph books and they set a place up there. Anyone that's interested in any of my tours this year, they're up, up there by the book there the table, by grass. Yeah. Any questions? Surrender is going to focus on surrendering of 
all days on the 4th of July. Now they do not, after Reconstruction, they ignore 4th of July in Vicksburg until President Eisenhower visits Vicksburg in 1967. It's the first time the city itself celebrates uh, the 4th of July since 1877 with the aid and, 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 and end of Reconstruction. Hayes, in that deal that made him president of the United States in 77, has to agree to pull the troops out of the South and sacrifice uh, the black folk. Sir, uh, I, I heard the contention that if the South had retained their capital in Montgomery, deep within the Confederate territory, that Lee would have been free for a much more wide-ranging war maneuver uh, and would have been more effective in giving space to draw the Union away from their supply lines and, and perhaps win the campaign in the East, but you know, being impelled to stay in front of Richmond uh, is, is scratching as much longer. All right, uh, focus again on the uh, leadership of the cavalry in the East. Now, Buford does very well on day one. For some reason, Secretary Stanton, think of Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld. He has a reputation of being one being SOB. Uh, he would look like a whip compared to Secretary of War Stanton, uh, Edward McMaster Stanton. For some reason, Stanton did not like Buford will uh, remove himself from contention because he catches typhoid in early December night, uh, 1863. Uh, uh, Stanton is so small and uh, unfeeling that he waits till Buford has almost breathed his last before he transmits news to him that he's now a major general. So with, with Buford dead, that's going to open the slot for Grant to pick the new commander of the Army of Potomac's Cavalry. Uh, President, while a good manager, wouldn't know the truth if he saw it. He's a self-promoter, uh, and Pleasanton will be relieved of command of the Union Cavalry. He'd been command of the Cavalry at Gettysburg. Hubert was the division commander. So following the fiasco of the dog would kill Patrick Gray, in late February, Pleasanton is sent west. So there is no chief of cavalry in the Army of the Potomac. So Grant, when he arrives, has, has met Sheridan as an infantry commander. Grant gets to know Sheridan when he becomes commander of the military division of the Mississippi. Sheridan is a good, uh, Sheridan is a rah-rah uh, fellow, very lucky. Uh, he leads men a lot into combat, but the only time he is ever seriously wounded is against the Indians in Oregon Territory in 1864. Now, Sheridan, Sheridan thinks he's the first person, and his men are the first up on the missionary ridge. Uh, T.J. Wood would say, B.S., my men were up there first, but Sheridan uh, has more public appeal. So Grant will pick Sheridan. That's the only change when he arrives as general in chief and has made the decision that Sherman will stay out west and commander of the military division of the Mississippi, command of an army group, including Army of the Cumberland, Army of Tennessee, and Army of the Ohio. Grant will, Grant will take that with the 
go to the telegraph. Grant will go into the field and be looking over General Meade's left shoulder, or right shoulder. So Grant will, so Meade's orders will be where Lee goes, you will go. So, where, so that means where Meade goes, Grant will go. So, uh, and at first, they get to work, they get to learn to work together and by the end of May. But in early, in, in, uh, on the 8th of June, there's a big argument. <coughs> Meade and Sherman, excuse me, Meade is known as Old Snapping Turtle. But the Snapping Turtle is a very vicious reptile. He's been known as the Snapping Turtle since he got on West Point. And Sherman and Sheridan uh, has a very, very hot temper. They have this terrible argument on the evening of the 8th of May, in which, in Sheridan's mind, in Meade's <coughs> mind, the cavalry had not done well. So Grant will intervene. Grant intervenes on Sheridan's side. So in Meade's presence, he will say, why don't you let General Sheridan run the cavalry and you run the army? That's a real slap in the face to General Meade, meaning that if they, there's ever a disagreement between Sheridan and Meade, who is, in my age mind, who is Sherman, who is Grant going to support? Then on the 25th of May, Sherman writes an unfortunate letter to General Grant. It should never have been read in public because at, the, uh, at Carmel Church, they're having a staff meeting. Grant and his staff, now Grant's staff is loyal to him, Meade's staff is loyal to him because those staffers wouldn't be in that position. For some reason, Colonel Badeau, that's the nurse maid on Grant's staff to Fred, during the Vicksburg campaign, he gets the idea of reading Sherman's letter out loud. And Sherman's letter says, well, he's, he, Sherman is really standing along. And he says, uh, I'm on the Etowah. It's a rebel gone in Georgia. I'm doing well. And I hope to hear good news from the Army of the Potomac. Because now that they're inspired by you, they will do much better. As they say, Meade was very nearsighted. One of his staffers says, his eyes all but pop out of their sockets. <laughs> and would have accepted more thick glasses. <laughs> and Meade will get up, stand up, and he says, try to tell me just why the Army of the Potomac needs to be inspired by you. They're getting very hot work. When they leave there, Carmel Church, Grant gets on his horse and his staff start off trotting their horses. Grant's a wonderful horseman, and he, from the time he is in your fair city, fair town at that time, when he went riding, he liked no Buddy, to be in front of him. So they say me gets on his horse, he's grinding his chops, his, his oars, puts his spurs to old Baldy, and me and his staff pass Grant. That night, me will write a letter to his wife and say, I really ought to resign, but I'm too, I'm too good a painter. Resign, so he does not resign, and then within, a, within about two weeks, he and Grant have worked out their problems between each other. So, you know, Peterson, think of General, think at the think on the 18th of 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 of, of December, 1945, when things are not doing well. Battle of the Balls commenced on the 16th, 
What would Eisenhower have done if George Capitol Marshall caught a plane over to Reims, France, and took charge? As a physician, General Reed sees himself. It's very similar to that. And of course, Eisenhower now they would resign. But he also had a hot temper. Or he might have done the same as General Meade. That really should, but have too much of a paper to do it. So you don't know what's going to happen with a dozen houses. Now, even more exciting would be if uh, Marshall decided to suddenly go over and look over God's right shoulder in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? I know that uh, Hooker remained with the Army for the remainder of the war. Can you touch a little bit on where he did and whether he was in the I'm going to get out and clip my your I know that Hooker remained with the Army for the remainder of the war. Can you touch on a little bit of what he did and or didn't do? All right. Hunter is relieved of command of the Army of the Potomac on the 20, on the night of the 27th day of June. Or you say in the early morning hours of the 28th. So he's out of a job. Now after the Battle of Chickamauga, the War Department grant Decide they're going to send two corps of the Army of the Potomac out to Chattanooga. That will be the 11th Corps, commanded by Oliver Otis Howard, along with your friends in the 61st Corps, I hope. And uh, th that will be the uh, that would be the uh, 12th Corps under General Slocum. So they go out to. Uh, uh, to Bridgeport, Alabama, under General Hooker's command. Howard swallows his pride, Slogan says, I'm not going to, I can't respect Hooker as a man or a soldier, so they say, all right, you stay up in Murfreesboro and watch the railroad. So Hooker is in command now of uh, the 11th and 12th Corps that participate in the battle of for Chattanooga. In fact, the first men are the ones that seized the Mountain. Battle of the Clouds on the 24th. During the winter of 1863, 64, they consolidate the 11th Corps and 12th Corps and redesignate them the 20th Corps, which is commanded by General Hooker. Hooker commands it. It's in the Army of the Cumberland. Now, Hooker uh, doesn't like General Sherman. Sherman doesn't like General Hooker because Hooker had, had bad days as a civilian living in California in the early 1850s. Sherman is a banker in San Francisco. Hallett has made Married a wealthy woman and has lots of money. Hooker is not doing well. Dead broke, plays too much poker, probably draws to too many inside straights, and drinks too much whiskey on the, on the Sonoma Square. And broke goes and borrows money from Sherman, probably from the bank, Sherman, the president of the bank, and never repays his loan. So Sherman sees him as a dead man. He doesn't repay Halleck, the money he borrowed from Halleck. So he's made two powerful enemies. As they see him as a, as, uh, 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 they see him in the worst light. Now when the person gets killed on the Battle of Atlanta on the 28th, now immediately taking command of the Army of Tennessee is General Logan, also a politician general. Probably the best of the politician generals. And he does pretty, he does damn good for, from the 22nd to the 28th to the 26th. Then we're going to have to appoint someone to command the Army of the Tennessee. 
by rank, Hooker should get it. He's a senior major general in the Army, has been an Army commander, and he should get it. Now, is Sherman telling the truth? I don't know. But he decides to bypass both Hooker and General Logan. He's going to say he'll pass the blame on Thomas, who he says recommends Howard. So he, he names Howard to command the Army of Tennessee. Hooker says, that son of a bitch tossed me the battle of Chancellorsville. Well, he wasn't born in a petticoat, he should have been. So Hooker asked to be relieved of command. Logan shoulders his iron. And he says, the West Point Protective Association has just done me in. So he goes to Congress after the war. And like all people that go to Congress, he wants, he thinks he can make a better president. So as a member of Congress, he gets the West Point budget and he starts cutting them to appropriate. He's taking revenge on West Point. Now the best thing that happens from West Point, uh, Logan runs for vice president on the ticket uh, with James G. Blank, where they slung a lot of mud. Now the Republicans chanted, where's Papa Pa going to the White House? Ha ha ha! Because Cleveland had an illegitimate child. And Blaine becomes a continental liar from the state of Maine. So because of that, Logan loses, since he's a junior man on the Blaine ticket. For the first time since Buchanan is president, Democrats capture the presidency. Logan then decides there'll be round two coming up. That'll of course be the election of 1830, uh, 1860, uh, 1888. Uh, uh, so he's out to be the Republican nominee. So he hires the painting of the Atlanta cycle. Comes out of the Logan pot and out of his pack. Now, who's the hero in the Sakurama Atlanta? Who's the man leading the charge that throws the Confederates back? John A. Logan. Where's where is Sherman? You've got to have the flash a light on him. You see, Sherman. He's up at Coppin, Coppin's Hill where the Carter Library is. Where's poor old Matt? He's in an ambulance park there as a corp. So, for, so but unfortunately, before the 88 convention, Logan dies. So West Point and Holly takes a deep breath and uh, feels we're not going to have this SOB cutting their budget every year. And how much more dangerous would he be if he was president than a member of the uh, Military Affairs Committee in the House? So Hooker will end up then, Hooker will end up in command of Cincinnati. Command of the Department of Ohio, with headquarters in Cincinnati, and he'll approve the last death sentence meted out by Union Court Martial uh, during the war. And he will marry, and he's the one that introduced me to his wife, uh, a very wealthy young lady living in uh, Cincinnati, has a lot of money, will live another 10 years, and he'll use her fortune to pay for that handsome painting up at Point Park, where he is the hero on his white horse, as his men store missionary rich, which cost $20,000 back there in the 18, uh, uh, mid, uh, late 1860s. Any other questions? General Jackson had a job. Where do you feel the outcome of the case for his might have been? What's that? General Jackson. All right. That's one of the great questions. If Jackson hadn't died, 
says that General Thomas is underrated. Yes. Thomas is underrated. And for and General Grant, unfortunately, one of the things that against you that I would criticize of a Grant admirer, of a Grant, if I was alive in the Civil War, I would know how to get around with Grant. If Grant turned a fast corner, I'd break my nose. <laughs> <laughs> Under, under General uh, 
first under Buell, and then under uh, General uh, Bushwhack. So, so then Sherman enters into the scene again. Sherman has a kind of a mean sense of humor. He undoubtedly, if he knows Thomas as well as he claims he does, he would have to know that Thomas is somewhat sensitive. And Sherman claims he knows Rathbone. How well he's doing, I know how well Sherman says he does. But during the overland, uh, during the campaign from Chattanooga to Atlanta, <coughs> Thomas, in mid-February, had discovered Snake Creek Gap. Yeah, that's the key to breaking the Confederate initial defense line. Thomas, since he found it, called it to Sherman's attention. He's a little round off when Sherman gives his pets. Sherman's pets are the same as Grant. Army of Tennessee. And Sherman assigns passing to Snake Creek Gap to McPherson, not to Thomas. And even Sherman, after McPherson muffs it, will have that conversation with Mac and his Mac and Sherman do it today. As he penetrates Snake Creek Gap, runs and finds out their Confederates in Zaga, and he pulls back out of St. Creek Gap. So Thomas is not happy with that decision. Then Sherman, uh, Sherman is a rugged outdoors type. He doesn't wear boots, he wears house slippers or joggers. He eats off, a, he eats off tinware, uh, lives a real rugged. And he uh, travels very light. Thomas, overweight, undoubtedly already suffering from heart problems, travels, sleeps in a good tent or a house every night, eats off crockery, eats off a uh, uh, tablecloth as napkins, has a very elaborate headquarters, and Sherman starts referring it to Thomas's headquarters as Thomas's service. Now that would, Grant lives rather simply, that would not set well with Grant either, that Thomas is, travels very heavy, uh, Hard to get moved. Then he writes one that is a real low blow. He says, I can't get the army of Cumberland to move. This is written to Grant. Because they encounter, every time they encounter a furrow out in a field, they halt and entrench. So you can see those God guides going there. Now, then, of course, Thomas uh, is sent back to Middle Tennessee to take care of Hood. After the Battle of Franklin on the 30th, Schofield falls back in the national defenses, very strong. Whiskey Smith has arrived with his uh, 10,000 Israelites from, uh, as they call themselves, from Missouri. Uh, Wilson is re-equipping the cavalry, so Thomas is waiting until he can get the army of the Cumberland organized. He begins receiving, Grant begins to receive poison pen telegrams, signed by historians. It is that Thomas isn't going to move. He's going to keep delaying, and one morning they're going to wake up and find 
that Hood has crossed the Cumberland River upstream or downstream and in, in route to Central Kentucky. Right at that time, we'll send a telegram from City Point to Halleck, his chief of staff, and alert him that General Scope, uh, Thomas will be relieved and General Schofield will take command of the Army to come. But on the 8th, they get a sleet storm. Sleet storms like you get in southern Ohio and in middle Tennessee that puts an inch of sleet on everything. So Thomas gets a retreat. They suspend the order, relieving Thomas and turning Schofield over. By the 13th, the sleet is melted, and Brown is very muddy, and his story starts sending poison pen telegrams to Washington that, again, Thomas is not going to move. Some morning, they're going to wake up and find the Confederates on the way to Kentucky. So Grant, down at City Point, will get on a steamboat and arrive in Washington on the morning of the 15th. Planning to go personally out to Louisville, the telegram General Logan has been on a long leave campaigning for Lincoln for the second inaugural, for the second election. And he calls General Logan, he's thought it over, and Logan, is the annoying one, not Schofield. He tells Logan to meet me at Louisville and we'll proceed to Nashville and relieve, you'll relieve General Thomas. Now the code clerk reads the first telegram in that day that indicates that Thomas has moved out and is attacking the enemy. The code, it comes into code. So the code clerk decides skating on very thin ice. He decides not to hold the telegram, claiming he's having trouble with the code until late afternoon. And only in the late afternoon does he transmit the telegram to Grant. By that time, a telegram has arrived that Thomas's attack is succeeding beyond their wildest dooms. Uh, Yuli probably says a little bit of profanity, puts it as where he tells him to forget my trip to Louisville. Logan, get, get back to duty with your uh, in Illinois. And, uh, and uh, Thomas, of course, wins a, the battle, finishes up on the 16th. Now, Thomas cannot believe that it's Schofield. Everybody's telling him it's Schofield, all his friends, and he can't believe it. Finally, in 1871, Thomas is in command of the Department of the Pacific. He is, I don't know what he weighs now, he weighed 300 pounds in the Army. He had, fall, he had stepped off a train in the spring of 1961 and it hurt his back, so they, he walked with a gimp. He now sits down, he finds out who the, the guy in the wood pile is. James McAllister Schofield. So in a very agitated frame of mind, he writes the letter, blasting Schofield. And now he had a, very, he had a weak ticker, feels a bad pain in his left arm, a bad pain in his chest, within 24 hours he's dead of a heart attack. In other words, be careful when you get angry. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, thank you.
And then the announcement that we made last year, again, we didn't talk to Ed about it ahead of time, but uh, hopefully we'll be able to say here uh, on the stage that we're going to do this again next year. Yes. Yeah. I Thank you again. Come.